So today we're going to talk about energy supply. And just to orient you, I am going to show you the schematic that you've already seen yesterday um, to just make it easier um, to understand what we're talking about today. Um, so all energy, all parts of the energy supply system are covered in LEAP. We have the transformation analysis, stock changes, land use change, and land-based resources, as well as resource extraction of fossil fuel, hydro, et cetera. Here's an overview of a number of concepts that we will elaborate on during this presentation. LEAP is, um, supports modeling all the links in the energy supply chain from resource extraction to energy trade, energy conversion and delivery to end users. And it is, we want to emphasize that LEAP is demand driven. It's an engineering based um, solution. So essentially what happens in LEAP is that it will figure out what the final energy demand is and then it will mobilize supply to meet this demand. You can set constraints in the way um, the supply is provided. So you may be limiting the capacity of um, specific processes. Um, but at the first instance, LEAP will just go ahead and try to meet the demand that is modeled under the demand section, which you see here on the tree on the very top um, from the supply side. There are primarily two branches that take care of this, which are the resources branch and the transformation branch. And the transformation branch consists of different modules, which um, allows you to set up the capacities. So the resources branch covers the extraction of primary energy resources, imports and exports, and the transformation branch covers the conversion of one fuel or energy carrier to another, as well as um, the transport and transmission and the distribution of fuel. Um, the total primary energy supply, primary resource reserves, and annual yields, imports, and exports are also tracked in resources. Um, and then the transformation structure consists of modules, which essentially are the higher level um, categories within your transformation processes. So here on the left, for example, we would have distributed generation and electricity generation shows. So this is referring to small scale distributed power generation and large utility electricity generation. You may have gas transmission and gas production as well as oil refining. So these are primarily trans uh, transformation processes, but they may also include transport processes. Um, in addition, transformation Modeling allows for the simulation of process capacities, expansion and dispatch. So these are constraints that you can set as you develop the individual modules and the processes that are set underneath. So for example, under oil refining, you have one process refinery, which has a feedstock fuel of crude oil and several output fuels, gasoline, diesel, residual fuel oil, and several others. In LEAP, you have the choice of two overall methodologies. You can either follow a rule-based simulation or you can use optimization to meet demand. Um, today, we're gonna focus primarily on the rule-based simulation, so I will go ahead and we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, and you can also do cost benefit in emission accounting, um, which can be integrated throughout the supply model. So here I'm just highlighting the two main categories that fall under supply modeling in this branch. And so in, to, in order to enable something that I, oh, before I go ahead, it's something that I just wanna add. Yesterday there were some questions in the chat over whether it was necessary 
to follow along in your own lead model as we were going through this. That is of course possible. And if you would like to do that, please go ahead. But it's not necessary. We're really trying to just show you and orient you in the LEAP interface in this part of the presentation. And so we wanna make sure that when you go ahead and you do the exercises, that you know where you find certain modules. Um, and so it's absolutely fine to just be following along the lectures, um, no matter what, that will make it a lot easier for you to follow the exercise because you'll already know where certain things are located. And then we also just use this opportunity to show a couple of extra, um, extra settings and definitions throughout LEAP. So this is really, it's really not necessary to um, do all the things that we do um, on the screen um, on your own, in your own LEAP model. However, if of course we're being too fast um, and you cannot follow even watching, please do interrupt and we'll be happy to go back and redo certain settings and setups so that you can really truly follow them. And so in order to enable supply modeling in LEAP, you need to activate um, transformation and resources in the settings. And I'm just going to show you how to do this in LEAP. So this is the same model that you should have now. It's the Fredonia area after exercise. Just pull that up. So this is after exercise 3.4. And so at this point, we only have demand branches set up. And in order to activate transformation and resources, we go into this general, we go into general and then we select the settings. And we activate transformation and resources here. Um, there is also a number of other options that you can activate. Um, land use change and the land-based resources that we talked about, the statistical differences and stock exchanges. So you can see a lot of these items just represent the different modules that we've shown on the schematic before. And when I do that, automatically two branches will appear, transformation and resources. And so LEAP has gone ahead and based on your selections, set up these high-level branches for you. Charlotte, could I just... Add, mm -hmm. add a bit to what you were saying about the other supply options there. If you could go back oh, yeah, to absolutely. the settings screen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I pulled them up. Please. So as Charlotte showed you, transformation and resources is the first box that you would want to check if you want to do any supply modeling. And that's the most basic type of supply modeling. Those other two boxes, land use change and land-based resources and statistical differences and stock changes, are for particular advanced topics within supply modeling. Most users don't use them. But just so you know what they're about, and you can read more about them in the help too, land use change and land-based resources allows you to model land use and different land use types within your area and model the production of bioenergy on that land. Often wood, but it doesn't have to be wood. It could be a, a particular crop that's being raised for bioenergy purposes. So think about that as land use modeling for bioenergy. And the other category, statistical differences and stock changes is for those two particular types of information that could be included in an, in an energy balance. So statistical differences, for example, represent the differences between final energy demand and energy supply in an energy balance after the balance has been completed to the best of the analyst's capability, there may still be some small discrepancies. So you could you can get extra categories in LEAP to show those extra top level branches if you click that box. You can also get an extra top level branch for stock changes, which represent the additions to or, or, or um, withdrawals from stocked energy, such as stored natural gas in your system in the course of a year. Those stock changes and statistical differences are really only used if you're trying to make your model reproduce an ener a pre-existing energy balance quite exactly. But I do, do wanna just highlight what those are so that you're aware of them. And one other thing that we might just also point out, Charlotte, is the option that you showed for reverting to a different version of an area. Could you maybe bring that up on your screen yeah. again? 
So I've used this and Charlotte has used this in our workshop so far, but we haven't really pointed out what this is all about. So when you create a model, Leap auto saves it from time to time. And every time it auto saves it, it creates a new version as it calls it, which is like a save point if you're familiar with that terminology in, in, an, in a computer operating system. It's just a point in time that you, it's a version of it that you can revert to if you want to. You can also tell it to make a version of your model that you can revert to in the future. You can tell it to do that itself, or it to, you can tell it to do that at a particular point in time by choosing the make version option in this menu. And once you have versions created for your model, you can revert to them at any particular moment that you want to. In the Fredonia model, which is delivered with Leap, you get it when you install Leap, we include versions that correspond to the different points in the standard exercise manual. So that's why we were able to easily reconstitute a version of Fredonia that corresponds to the end of the first exercise that you just did. And, and that's how we did it. I would say that as a practical matter, if you start creating large models for, for real world analyses, Versioning does take up quite a bit of disk space. So you need to be cognizant of that. Every time you create a version, it basically takes a copy of your model and saves it. And then you can, you can revert to that version in the future if you want to. But if you have a model that is already many megabytes large, then you will be taking up that much additional space every time you create a version. So just be aware of that. And just quickly, I see a question in the chat, which version are you working with? You were trying to follow along with the built-in Fredonia data, right? No. So we are working now with version 1.3.4. Thanks, Charlotte. Are there any other questions from now? Okay. So we've now created the transformation and resources branch in our model. Sorry, I'm going a bit fast. And as I just said, and as you saw, Leap automatically added branches for uh, resources and transformation. And so let's have a look at what is in the resources branch. The resources branch contains primary and secondary fuels. And so the primary fuels contain all those fuels. It automatically, I should add, it automatically recognizes those fuels that you've already included in the model. So it will go through your demand module or your demand uh, branch, and it will detect all those fuels that you have identified. And so I'm going to open the secondary one as well. So these are the six fuels that have been used in the demand side modeling. And they're being split out into primary fuels and secondary fuels, where the primary fuels refer to all those fuels that are derived directly from nature and can be essentially used as is. And the secondary fuels uh, refer to um, fuels that are produced from some other energy carrier. And so if, for example, um, we go in, so on the very top next to scenarios, there is a button that is called fuels. And here you can find more information about the fuels that are included in your model. And this is part of um, Leap's default database. So you will have access to this and there is an overview of the different fuels. And then you can also look at an individual fuel. So natural gas, you just look at that one fuel. And there are a number of categories. So this will tell you what the net energy value is for natural gas that LEAP will be using in order to, unit, to do unit conversions, as well as a number of other physical characteristics. And you can scroll down there to see them. And then there is also a category that is type. So when I open this, you can see that there are a number of types. And this is how LEAP detects what type this fuel should go under under the resource branch. So this is a fossil resource. And so it will place it under the primary fuel branch.
And then um, the other part, um, yeah. And so I think the, it's just um, one other thing that you can add is that there is, so for each of the fuels that are in here, you will, Leap will also provide a number um, of variables. These are also determined by the fuel type. Um, and so, for example, for natural gas, you'll have addition to reserves, resource inputs, and you have, um, and reserves essentially uh, refers to how much um, natural gas is available. Whereas for renewable resources as wood, there is a category called yield, and that refers to how much wood can be extracted. And so it's just a way that LEAP essentially different, uses different terminology for um, renewable and non-renewable resources in order to set the limits or the constraints of what, um, of what can be extracted for each of those. So let's move ahead to the transformation module layout. This is really where most of the action is in Leap. Um, initially, you get an empty branch and you get to set up your own modules. And there are different types of modules that you might consider. Um, you can, for each module, you can produce one or more output fuels. So you have a feedstock fuel, a process that is um, that has a certain efficiency, a conversion efficiency. And then you have the module dispatch and you have an output fuel. And you also have auxiliary fuels. Auxiliary fuels refer to supplemental fuels that may be used along with the primary fuels. So this could, for example, be a lubricant that is being used on an engine. Um, so these will just be other fuels that are also required, but that are not necessarily transformed into the output fuel. And then you may also have a co-product such as heat, which is produced in the process in addition. So these are uh, a necessary co-product um, that is produced during the, during the process. And you have to, um, set the rules on how the dispatch takes place and how particular outputs will respond to certain dispatch requirements. Um, and there are a variety of ways that you may consider setting up your um, transformation modules. The very simplest is where you essentially only have one to represent um, a loss. So a loss during the process um, you may have a single feedstock fuel, like as shown here, just one process and one output fuel. So for example, if you um, have natural gas transmission, you would have uh, the feedstock fuel would be natural gas here. You would have some losses during the transmission and then you would um, actually deliver the natural gas to households, for example. You may also have a module that defines a single input fuel, but multiple output fuels. So an example of this would be petroleum refining. Um, and in this case, I, also the example that I just showed you in the, in the branch before um, was petroleum refining. So you may have a, a, single, a single feedstock fuel, so petroleum, and then you would transform it into a variety of output fuels. And finally, you could have a multi-process uh, transformation module. And so electricity is the most, electricity generation is the most important example um, for a multi-process transformation module. You may have multiple feedstock fuels um, that are passed through processes that each have a certain efficiency, but you only generate a single output fuel, which is electricity that is then dispatched in order to meet demand. Alternatively to defining processes, you could also use the transformation branch to um, define specific plants. So one here, the example is that you have different processes 
that I, as I just talked about, you may have co-fired steam that transforms bituminous coal and biomass into electricity. You have nuclear power that has a certain efficiency and produces electricity. And then you also produce electricity from natural gas, wind and solar. But if you knew a lot about your energy system with a lot of detail, um, or you would just want to represent um, it differently here, you would have the option to also specify specific plans under each of these. So you could have your first co-firing planned, and then maybe you would have a second co-firing steam plant. You could have multiple nuclear plants. So you could um, develop a lot of resolution in this, in this part. So the example of a petroleum refining module would be you um, have crude oil as an input, then you have all your different refineries bundled up together and just refineries, which have an efficiency of 95%. And you dispatch the refined crude oil, um, which now is either gasoline, diesel, LPG fuel, or kerosene, bitumen, or lubricants um, from this module. The example of a simple non-dispatched transformation module could be when you input electricity to a process and you just have certain losses, or this could even be the transmission line of electricity, you have certain losses. Um, an example may be where um, electricity lines, um, people attach their households informally to electricity lines and you and use that electricity often in a leap model that was would be simply represented as as losses. Um, another um, example would be natural gas um, pipelines, where you would also have a certain amount of losses during the transmission to households. The typical process for setting up a supply analysis. Um, is outlined here and consists of kind of four essential steps. You first want to map the components of your supply system to the transformation and resources branch. So you want to decide whether the different components in your supply system either should be represented under the transformation or the resource branch. And I will talk much more about these individual steps. The second step is to sequence the transformation modules because the order at which you set up the transformation modules in LEAP is very important. And I will talk more about that later too. You then set the transformation module properties, specify the output fuels and enter the process data. And then at the very end, you enter data in the resource branch. The different transformation modules, so your electricity generation, um, your transmission lines, those can be connected since they depend on each other and they need to be in the right order in the tree. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that. So when you map out your supply system components, you have to ensure that every supply source and activity is appropriately represented in LEAP. And you also have to answer the a key question about what the system boundary is. So when you have to decide whether a specific process should be represented under the transformation module or the resource branch, and these definitions that were put up here, you should kind of note down and use for your reference because they will really help you identify how you're going to represent your particular system, your supply system in LEAP. So if you have to use a model, um, if you have to model energy conversion from one energy carrier to another, you have to represent, you want to represent energy losses, you need to represent production capacity or dispatch multiple production option, uh, options, or you want to represent intra-annual variation in demand and supply, or you have this, you want to see and 
um, do a cost analysis of disaggregated production cost, including the capital cost, the operation and maintenance costs. If any of these conditions apply, you would want to represent that particular process under the transformation branch. Conversely, if they don't apply, then you can represent your process in the resource branch. And the resource branch is used to model primarily the production of primary energy resources, as well as required fuel imports and exports, where none of these con the conditions that I just outlined above apply. Charlotte, before we move off of mm -hmm. this slide, so I, I do just want to want to really emphasize or ask you really to pay close attention to what Charlotte just presented. Because when you get to setting up a supply model in LEAP, you, you might find yourself really wondering, well, what is resources doing and what is transformation doing? Come back to this slide and use this as kind of a checklist to see whether you actually need to set up a transformation module for a particular element of your supply system. Um, again, the, the most common reasons for setting up a supply module is when you're mo modeling energy conversion from one form to another, or when you want to model capacity, or when you want to model um, when you want to model intraannual variation in demand and supply. There are some other op some other reasons that are listed on this slide as well. So do pay close attention to that. And then also before we proceed, I'm just going to call attention to one other thing that Charlotte said earlier which is about the level of disaggregation that you adopt within these branches. So LEAP itself sets up the resources branch for you, and it provides a disaggregation into primary versus secondary fuels. And then it shows a branch for each fuel under those categories. That part is given. Trans in the transformation branch, you choose the disaggregation yourself. And you can choose to represent things in a very aggregate way if you want to, or in a very disaggregated way. Usually people who are setting up transformation modules use a, a particular module. So that's the first level right underneath the transformation branch. They use each module to represent a particular supply industry or sector like electricity generation or petroleum refining or natural gas extraction. And then they, use the processes within the module, usually to represent either technologies or major plants. But sometimes you, they go deeper. And you can, for example, in an electricity generation module, you can even represent individual electricity generating units as different processes within the module. So you'll have to, as the modeler, make a choice about the level of detail that you want to adopt. And that should be informed by the data that you have available the types of questions that you're trying to answer with the model and the level of fidelity that you're trying to achieve with the model. If you are trying to show how differences in dispatch vary by plant, then you're going to have to have plants in your model specifically and you won't be able to aggregate processes at the technology level. So just keep those, those issues in mind as we proceed here and remember that like in many things leap provides you a great deal of flexibility in transformation modeling that's up to you to figure out how you want to take advantage of that and what level of breakdown you want to have in your model okay yes and uh I think the next step that is really important to consider here is that the module ordering that in, with which you implement these different modules under your transformation branch is extremely important. Because we said at a high level, LEAP is going to um, mobilize supply in order to meet the demand that you have modeled in the demand branch. But it does that in a very particular way. It essentially goes into the transformation branch takes each of the modules in the order that they are given. So here, transmission and distribution, electricity generation and coal mining. And then attempts with each of these modules, one after another to satisfy the demand. And so if you have set certain capacity constraints on a specific 
on a specific one of these modules, then it will take those into consideration. And if it is not able to meet demand with the first module, then it will pass on that demand or the remainder of that demand that it could not satisfy to the next module. And so this way it's passed on the tree. There is this linear connectivity between going from demand into the transformation through the different modules. And if the demand cannot be satisfied in the transformation module, then that demand will eventually get passed down to the resources branch. And so that really is illustrated by this default order that Leap gives you for the transformation um, branch versus the resource branch. So the transformation branch comes first and is then followed by the resource branch because this is the order that Leap will consider these processes in order to satisfy demand. So let's now um, think a little bit about how that looks in practice. If you've added a module, the first step is to order them. And the second step is to, um, is to set their properties. And you can do, so the, when you click, right click on electricity set generation, and you set the properties, this little window pops up. And you can specify what types of data you want to include. You can activate the costs, turn them on or off in a particular model if costing is activated in your model overall. You can set capacities. So this will activate a variable that allows you to set capacities. If you do not activate capacities, Leap will assume that capacity is unlimited. And then you can also activate um, two properties that are required in order to model interannual variation of the system load on that module, which are the system load curve and the planning reserve margin. And then you can also choose to model co-products, such as heat, for example. Um, and you have to specify what that co-product is. Um, and in which processes in that module that co-product will be produced. And if you have multiple fuels, you can also um, activate output shares. If you don't activate output shares, Leap will assume that outputs are produced. So for example, if you have an, an oil refinery, you will Leap will assume that the outputs of the different fuels are in proportion to the requirements. So depending on what the requirements are that are set in your demand model, so you may have um, different amounts of um, LPG versus kerosene that are required in your demand model. So if you do not check output shares here, Leap will just assume that the output of your refining process will produce 50% of kerosene and 50% of LPG. If you set output shares here, then you can define the specific output shares that you want generated every time that plant is turned, that process is turned on. And then finally, you can um, select how you would like to enter efficiency data. So all of these three options, efficiency, losses, and heat rates, essentially do the same. They define how much of the input um, energy is transformed into useful energy. But, but you can select um, alternatively to efficiencies, which is the default losses or heat rates. So let's add a module to transformation. So we can see how this is done. So we go on to transformation. We'll add a module we'll call it electricity generation. And we will, so that you can follow along with this exercise, we will activate exactly those types of data um, that are activated here. So we'll activate costs, capacities, which will allow us to activate system load and planning reserve margin, which are also activated here. 
and we will keep co-products output, output, output shares unchecked and we'll keep the efficiency data as efficiencies. And so you can see that now a process popped up under transformation called electricity generation. And that electricity generation has two sub-branches, output fuels and processes. And the output fuel is already set to electricity because this is what the electricity generation process does. And it also already adds a number of variables here, planning reserve margin, peak load ratio, system peak load shape. And we will talk about what these, what these different variables are in just a second. So as you just saw, um, Leap automatically creates categories for output fuels and processes. But the user now decides which outputs and processes to add to the categories. So what is actually going to be modeled and transformed and how um, electricity, which is the output fuel here, is generated. And so just, yeah. So I think something else that is also, um, that I just wanna point out again here, we talked a little bit about this already yesterday, is that for all these variables, if you have any questions as you set up your model, you can always go into the help session, section on top here, and you can look up what these different variables are. And then I, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about this for now. And then we'll talk a little bit more. We'll actually add some processes in just a second. Just uh, Charlotte, just quickly, mm -hmm. as, as you were showing people there in Leap, once you set a module up, you can add, choose to add whatever output fuels you want. Leap has provided a default output fuel here of electricity. If Charlotte clicked on the green plus now, she could add a second output fuel. She could have this module produce electricity and something else. That's probably not very realistic, but you could imagine, for example, the petroleum refinery that would have multiple output fuels. There was also an option when she created a new module, which was to create a simple non-dispatched module. And if you click on here exactly, you can see that checkbox there. So that is a, that's a, an option which will create, you can have a module with multiple output fuels, but each output fuel is produced by a different single process. And it's usually used in LEAP for modeling transmission and distribution losses. When you, if you want to have such a module, you have to check that box at the time that you create the module. Once a module is created as a regular module, which can have multiple processes feeding into multiple output fuels, you can't go back and select the simple non-dispatched option. So just keep that in mind. If Charlotte looked at the properties for electricity generation right now, she would find that box is grayed out. She couldn't change it. That's because you have to set that option at the time of module creation if you want to. It's just a restriction in Leap. But again, this option is really only used when you want to have a very, very simple structure which says, okay, for each output fuel, there's just one process that produces it. And usually that's used in LEAP for transmission and distribution losses. Yeah, and I think something that is nice to, to add to that is that even then you can enter that efficiency data as either an efficiency or as a loss. So depending on what type of data you have or how you would just, what your preference is on defining those um, losses during distribution, you could choose that here too. If you have enabled capacity modeling, which we just did um, in our electricity generation module, there are two major issues to consider. You have to decide on capacity expansion, which means how much capacity 
you are going to build and when, but also when capacity is retired. And this is usually given in an, in an energy, um, in, a, in a total um, generation units or megawatts, for example. And then the second thing you have to consider is dispatch. Um, so once built, how should your capa the capacity that you've built be operated? And this is usually determined in megawatts in megawatts per hour or kilojoules per output. There are two main methods for modeling capacity expansion and process dispatch in LEAP. The first one, and we mentioned this already previously very quickly, is rules-based simulation. So this means that the user defines the prioritization rules um, by which capacity is built, when it's built, and how it's retired and how um, it's dispatched. The other option that is embedded in LEAP is optimization. Here the user defines costs and performance parameters and then the model finds the least cost solution. So it will build and dispatch um, in accordance to what is the most cost efficient, if this is your optimization, the, the least cost solution to that, to that problem. Optimization is much more data intensive generally and more difficult to calibrate, but it really expands LEAP's functional possibilities. So for example, if you want to include energy storage and transmission power flow, then um, optimization is really um, how you can do that. And while um, LEAP does not have power flow transmission embedded in the LEAP interface, we do have an add-on which allows you to use NEMO, so the optimization um, tools, power flow capabilities. And we'll be happy to talk more about that if there is interest. This presentation, however, will focus, and also the exercises that we're going to go through, will really focus on rules based uh, capacity expansion. It's simpler and it's a good way to start understanding supply modeling. In rules-based capacity expansions, you have exogenous capacity as well as endogenous capacity. Exogenous capacity is how much capacity is assumed to exist in any given year. And uh, I should emphasize that LEAP will not retire any capacity on its own unless you tell to do so. And exogenous capacity is usually used for existing plants and firm plant capacity, so capacity that will certainly be built um, in the future. And then you also have endogenous capacity. This is essentially a set of prioritization options that allow LEAP to build capacity if it is needed to maintain the reserve margin. And the user specifies the reserve margin and the order and the addition size for these endogenous capacity options. So I just want to define quickly what the reserve margin is. The reserve margin is the available capacity that is required to be maintained when the system is at peak load. And just to illustrate how exactly LEAP calculates this, it is that it sums up the capacity across the different modules, multiplies it with, so it takes the sum of the um, product of the capacity across the different modules and the capacity credit that each of um, these modules contribute. So how much they're allowed to contribute to um, the reserve margin and then um, subtracts the peak load, divides it by the peak load and multiplies it with 100 in order to give you a percentage. And I'm just going to show you how all of this works in LEAP. Charlotte, there's a question that someone's raised asking mm -hmm. what a capacity credit is. Maybe I could speak to that for a second. The, so the purpose of reserve margins <clears throat> and capacity credits is to give you a way in LEAP to simulate resource adequacy 
in your model, or I should say capacity adequacy in your model. It's a way of assessing the reliability of your supply system. Now, in point of fact, in different energy supply industries, there are different ways that reliability is assessed. And, and the question is usually most prominent in power system operation, and there are a number of different reliability standards and metrics that are met in any given power system. The approach that's used in LEAP is a simpler approach that is appropriate for long-term energy modeling, and it's based on this idea of a reserve margin and then capacity credits. And the reserve margin system, it's intended to be a fairly flexible system that you can use to model the adequacy or the reliability of your system in, a, in, in different ways. But as Charlotte indicated, fundamentally what it is, is it is a measurement of how much available capacity there is when the system is at peak load. So when the, when the, the supply system is providing as much output as it needs to in a particular year, how much extra capacity is there? That represents a reliability, uh, well, it's called the reserve margin. It represents a, an extra margin of capacity for purposes of maintaining reliability. Now you as the modeler can set that reserve margin target to whatever level you want. And this is the variable that Charlotte is showing right now called planning reserve margin. And remember, this is one of the options that was turned on in module properties. So if you don't turn that option on, then you, you can't set the target yourself. And if you're modeling capacity, normally you're, you're, you're going to want to turn on the planning reserve margin as well. But then there's also a question of, well, what capacity counts toward the reserve margin? And that's where the, the capacity credit variable comes in. So the capacity credit is a way that you can assign a fraction or a percent score to each process in your model. And you can say what percentage of that process's installed capacity counts toward the reserve margin. And you could show us that if, well, you'll be able to see this once Charlotte adds a process to her model, which she'll do in a second. But that's the idea behind it. So, and the reason why you want to have that capability is that not all types of capacity count equally for purposes of system reliability and adequacy. This is, again, easiest to see in the power sector. If you have a natural gas generating station, for example, it may be highly flexible and you can dispatch it whenever you need to. And it may be down for 10% of the hours in a year for planned and unplanned maintenance. In that case, you would probably wanna give it a very high capacity credit, which indicates that its capacity, the installed capacity, the nominal nameplate value is almost always available when the system needs it for reliability purposes. As a first cut, you would probably set the capacity credit equal to the annual availability, which is in my, in my little example here, 90%, assuming it's down for 10% of the hours in the year for maintenance. But contrast that with a wind plant, for example, or a solar plant, whose output is, first of all, in the course of a year, it's much lower than its nameplate capacity, but also it's quite variable. And so in that case, if you have a megawatt of solar installed, you don't want it to count equally with a megawatt of natural gas toward your reliability margin. Now, and and that's, where you, that's where you would use the capacity credit. You would assign a lower capacity credit to the wind or solar plant to reflect the fact that it does not contribute equally to reliability, equally as compared to say the gas plant. But this is just a variable. Capacity credit is a variable that you can populate in LEAP like any other, and you can populate it with an expression, like as you can for any variable in LEAP. So you can assign a constant value, or you can assign a value that you can have a formula that calculates a value that changes over time. And it's a way that you can indicate to LEAP which processes in your model count more for reliability purposes. And then there was also a question about whether a country can rely on international sources for reserve margins. I think that in, in the general case, I would say there are 
you can learn something from international experience, but the appropriate reserve margin to use when modeling a particular country's system is very context specific. It depends on the age of the system, the how well maintained it is, what the grid operation rules are if we're looking at an electricity system, uh, how much, um, how much, um, what the loss rate is within the system and other factors. So it usually, if you're going to put together an electricity system model with a planning reserve margin, usually you want to do that in concert or in, in collaboration with the grid operators in the area or the country that you're studying. You can learn something from international experience and that tells you, for example, if you look at certain countries that have very low reserve margins, it, it will tell you what's possible in a very well-managed grid with, a, with a, a very effective power market behind the grid. But it's not usually appropriate to just take a value from the international, from a different country and put it into a model for your country. You usually should look at the, the specific factors in your country that lead to a greater or lesser need for reserve capacity. And again, just to give you kind of a, a sense of, of what some of the numbers are out there, in some areas of the world that have very well-managed grids, the reserve margin might be under 10%. It could be seven or 8%. But in other areas of the world where the management of the grid is more difficult, where there are, um, where there's the, there's a greater possibility of plants going out or, or going offline for different reasons that are not planned, the reserve margin target might need to be higher. It might need to be as high as 25 or 30%. There is a default value of 30% in LEAP, but I would take that with a grain of salt. You really do need to look at the situation in your respective country when you're setting up the reserve margin target for your modules. Thanks, Charlotte. And maybe you could show the creation of a process and show how that capacity yes. credit variable becomes available. Yes, that's absolutely what I was going to do next. So we're going to add some processes to see how um, the capacity credit as well as um, how the exogenous, how you add exogenous and endogenous capacity. So in order to add a process, you have to select processes. And then you click on the little plus sign. Um, and so we'll add um, coal bituminous as a first process, but we may call it subcritical steam. And then we'll add a couple of others for illustration. So let's also add a process called wind. And you see that leap will auto complete um, when you start typing and it will also propose a name and that name will usually will match the feedstock fuel that you give it, but you can then go in and change that name also, which I just did for subcritical steam. For wind, I will keep the proposed name. I'm gonna add one more called residual fuel oil. So you can see how um, a lot of these, like all these, Leap already has this library of these feedstock fuels that you can add. It makes it very easy and fast. So, when I now click onto um, any of the processes, I can also see all the different variables that a leap already sets up for me. And we can see exogenous capacity here and endogenous capacity next to it. The way that um, this window is set up, you can see all the three processes side by side. We're in current accounts now. Um, and I will add exogenous, and you can add the exogenous capacity for each of these processes just here. And so you could, for example, imagine that you're adding 
500 megawatts of subcritical steam, um, 100 megawatts of wind, and 1,000 megawatts of residual fuel oil. And so the units here are set to megawatt of production capacity, but you could change those units if you open that drop down menu. There is um, a number of other units that you could use if you wanted to. So this allows you to set the exogenous capacity. You could also, and so this is for current accounts. If we now switch to baseline, you can see that for the projection years, it just takes the values that you give it and maintains them. So these are constant throughout time. But you could imagine that, for example, you may um, want to have a decrease. And so this is easier to see as an error chart. You could imagine that you actually know that by 2030, you will, instead of having a thousand megawatts of capacity of res residual fuel oil, you would decrease um, that capacity. And so you could set the base here to a thousand. And then by 2030, you actually reduce that value. It's not letting me edit this. I'm just gonna finish, go into the builder and do it by hand. So here I would have base here, thousand. And you can see how Leap then um, treats this and it decreases the capacity of residual fuel oil between 2029 and 2030. You can represent it as a table or as a chart. We do encourage you to always check that whatever changes you made were actually accepted by Leap by looking at the table. And so this is a way that you could prescribe um, a retirement of residual fuel oil capacity in the future. Alternatively, you can set endogenous capacity. And here you have to add the specific processes for which you want to set the prioritization rules. And so we could add wind, and subcritical steam here to the endogenous capacity. And so this is where you're setting the prioritization rules for meeting the planning reserve margin. And so we could add 250. Um, so every time as LEAP goes through the supply, um, the supply module, so the transformation um, branch, it will try to build any of these um, processes whenever it is required to do so in order to meet demand. And so you could imagine that every time you would want LEAP to build a new wind plant, it would build that with um, a size of 250 megawatts. And maybe every time it would build a subcritical steam plant, you would build it with 500 megawatts and you can reorder these modules um, by clicking on the error here. So now it would first build a subcritical steam plant if it has a shortage of supply and then it would build, and if that wasn't enough, it would go and build a, um, it would go build 250 megawatts of wind. And if that wasn't enough, it would go back up build 500 megawatts of subcritical steam. And then there is also an option here, a variable, that is the capacity credit. And so as we just 
as Jason just illustrated quite extensively, but I'm just going to say it again here, the capacity credit is what fraction of the weighted capacity counts towards meeting the reserve margin. So you could, for example, imagine that it is very high for coal, which um, is a, it's a very stable plant, but low for wind, which is um, variable. So you could imagine that only you would set this, so this is a percentage, only 15% of the wind capacity would um, count as a capacity credit, whereas 100% um, percent of subcritical steam and 100% of residual fuel oil. Charlie, could I amplify one mm -hmm. point about the endogenous capacity? Yes. If you could flip back to that quickly. So just a couple of things I, I want to just reiterate to make sure that you keep them in mind. Remember that for exogenous capacity, that's totally modeler defined. You tell LEAP what exists and when it exists. And if it retires, you tell LEAP when it retires. And LEAP will assume that that exogenous capacity is available whenever you say it is. And it will use that to try to meet the energy requirements and the power requirements on the module. And then the endogenous capacity that we're looking at here is what LEAP is allowed to add on its own if it thinks it needs to, to maintain that reserve margin. And so the reserve margin is calculated based on the, the peak power requirements, as we've been discussing, and also based on the capacity credits that you assign to your processes. And when LEAP adds endogenous capacity, it manages that itself. It adds the new capacity, and then it retires it at the end of the capacity lifetime. Lifetime is a variable that you can specify in the current account scenario within a module. So just remember that ex for exogenous capacity, you're on your own. LEAP will do exactly what you tell it to, and it will not retire capacity automatically. For endogenous capacity, LEAP will use those possibilities to try to maintain the reserve margin target when it needs to, and it will retire the capacity on its own if it builds it. And as Charlotte said, it just cycles through the, the processes that you've defined here when it needs to add more capacity. It starts by adding, in this case, subcritical steam, then it moves to wind, then it goes back to subcritical steam, goes back to wind, and we'll keep on going for as long as it needs to, to add enough capacity to meet the reserve margin target. Thanks, Charlotte. So when we do the rules-based process dispatch, which we've just shown with the exogenous capacity and the endogenous capacity, how that is done prior to the first simulation year, and as you might remember from yesterday, in this case, our last current accounts year is 2010 and our first simulation year is 2011, it will use historical production. In and after the first simulation year, it will apply the dispatch rule. So the dispatch rules are process specific and they can vary by process in a module. So you can set the merit order, which are the user assigned priorities by which you're gonna activate certain processes to meet demand. Um, it, you can set the full capacity, which is 100% of the available capacity. So you have the capacity. This is calculated by multiplying the capacity that you've set with the maximum availability. And maximum availability is also a variable that you can set here in LEAP. You can define the percent share, which is the percent of module output requirements. Um, you can set the running cost in order um, of variable operations and maintenance and um, plus the fuel costs. And um, 
the dispatch in and after the first simulation year attempts to meet demand, which is um, which you've set in the demand module in megawatts per hour, as well as load, which is set in megawatts in each year and time slice, given the available capacity. So let's talk a little bit more about time slicing. Time slices divide the year into sub-annual periods. As you might remember, because we've mentioned it a few times, the default in LEAP is to run um, annual time steps. However, it does have the capacity to divide the year into sub-annual periods and achieve greater temporal resolution that way. So this is really used to model additional temporal detail in supply and demand of particular fuels. For example, in the demand side, you may imagine that electricity demand is not um, equal throughout the year, but may vary by seasons, um, times of day, and similar. And similarly, on the supply side, if you have a hydropower plant, for example, you may be able to run that hydropower plant at maximum capacity during certain times of the year, but not others. The time slices um, in the model are a single, you set, you essentially set a single time slice, a uh, set of time slices per model, which you have to configure in, gener in the general menu. And I will show you how to do that in just a minute. And we will also ask you to do that during the exercise. So um, this will be useful for the exercise as well. And then the various variables can be um, can also be time sliced. And uh, this is true as well for the module output requirements, which can be time sliced. And so you can have um, an exogenous your exogenous capacity be time sliced and attach a load shape to the module, and you can also attach a load shape to the endogenous capacity um, and each, as well as each final, final energy demand. Um, if the module requirements are not time sliced, then Leap reverts back to the, um, to the default and shows dispatch and uses dispatch for an entire year at a time. So Charlotte, we, we did have a question in the chat about mm -hmm. how power requirements, so variation in power requirements during a year could be modeled on the demand side of the model. And that's what this slide is getting at here. So when Charlotte says that module output requirements can be time sliced in an exogenous or endogenous way, what that means is that you can if you're choosing to time slice the production and the demand of a particular fuel, you can represent the variability in that demand. So therefore that would lead to variability in energy requirements by time slice and also changes in power requirements by time slice. You can represent that on the demand side of the model or on the supply side. And if you do it on the demand side of the model, what you're gonna do is you will attach a profile to each final energy demand that uses the particular fuel that you're interested in, say electricity, that's the most common one. You can attach a, a profile to each demand that shows when in the year the demand occurs. It's a load shape is what we call it. it and leap. if you do that, LEAP will then sum up the profiles of all of the demands using that fuel on the demand side of the model. And it will thereby come to a system-wide load, load profile. And that will be the, that system-wide load, pro, load profile will be what the supply module has to respond to. So that's how you would show different power demands in different parts of the demand model by, by choosing to do the, the endogenous option here and attaching load shapes to particular final energy demands. In a second, well, we can flip over to LEAP and we'll show you where to activate that. But the other option here is what we've called exogenous. And that's just, you define an overall load shape that you assign to the module. So you're not calculating a, an emergent load shape from the demands on the demand side, but you just have one overall shape 
Usually it would be the average load shape in the power system that you would use. And you would put it on the supply side of the model. And then what LEAP will assume is that all of the incoming demands for electricity, say, occur within that load shape. And so that load shape can be used to take the total demand side uh, requirement for electricity and spread it out over the course of a year. And I think it would be good to just show how we do this in LEAP. Charlotte, if you'll flip back to LEAP, yeah. we can just quickly show yes. people. So we should absolutely show you how to set up um, the time slicing mm -hmm. of LEAP. Yes, let's start there and then we can get on to load shapes and, and how you can do the demand side load shapes or the supply side. So in order to set up the time slices, you would go to general and you would select time slices. And so there is already um, time slices set up in this Fredonia model, which are not, there are nine time slices for a total of 8,760 hours in a year. And it has distributed the hours from zero to a thousand and so in, in steps up a thousand. But you can also set up um, a more detailed um, time slicing. So if we do that, you can, for example, choose to represent two seasons, a wet and a dry season. You may want to represent weekdays and week and days. And then you may choose to, um, to put in hourly detail. And we generally do recommend to put in data in our, with hourly detail because it allows you to change the time slices that you then apply at the later stage. And Leap will easily be able to reconfigure your time slices for you. And so we accept. And so now we have 96 time slices, still for a total of all hours of the year, 8,760. And these time slices um, are for weekdays, Mondays through Fridays, the first hour of a weekday in the wet season. And then you also have the first hour of the weekend during the wet season. And if we scroll down further, you will see the dry season is represented as well. And so it distinguishes as we set it between wet and dry seasons, weekdays versus weekends, and then all 24 hours in a day. So we can close this here. And so now we have set the time slices for the entire model. And then we can also add load shapes. And so one way, maybe we'll go into wind for this and we'll select maximum availability. And so you can upload yearly shapes that you can then reference in each of these variables by going into the yearly shapes. And then you can add shapes here and save them. And so you can actually set up specific load shapes for peak load, which is what Jason just talked about um, when you set your, um, your load exogenously. And you can then attach them. So when you save them, you can attach them to each of the variables. Um, I don't know whether, Jason, you think we should we should show something more here. You will definitely go through this in the exercise, and we're just we're helping let's, you to yeah, orient let's just you show, here. Just show one other thing up here, mm -hmm. and there is a question in the chat, which we will get to in just one second. But so Charlotte was showing you load shapes. Load shapes can be used to describe the variability of load in the course of a year. So that's how demand varies or requirements on a module vary in the course of a year. You can also use load shapes to represent availability profiles for 
for resources. Actually, there are several variables in Leap that can be time sliced. They include the load variables, but also maximum availability, merit order, and maybe one or two other things as well. So you can set up load shapes to describe the variability within the course of a year for any of those different types of variables. And there are different types of load shapes that correspond to each of them. Now, the two most important are load for so that that is the variability of demand in the course of a year and also availability for supply processes. For load curves for the variability of demand, remember there's an, an exogenous way and an endogenous way to specify those. And the exogenous way is just to put an overall load curve on the module, which you would get by going to the module itself if you click on electricity generation here and go to the system peak load shape variable. That's where you can choose a yearly shape that you want to associate with this. So a load curve you want to associate with the overall module. And if you click on the, on the box itself up at the top and then click on the little orange icon that comes up on the right, you can see you can choose yearly shapes from your list. Of those of the previously defined yearly shapes. The other way to do this would be to put load curves on your demands on the demand side of the model. We won't do this fully, but I'll just show you how you could enable that if you go to basic settings, Charlotte. And just to clarify, so here you see the system shape, which is already implemented, but you could, if you added other load shapes, then they would show up here and you could select Correct. them. Tell me again, where, should, where do you want me so to go? Go to basic to settings. Demand. And go to the calculations tab. The drop down at the bottom on the left for load shapes says, or it indicates whether you want to turn on demand side load shapes in your model. And that option to do that is the very last one here for each demand device. And if she chose that, then she would get a new load shape variable on the demand side of the model. And she could attach individual load profiles to each of her energy demands on the demand side of the model. So that's how that is done. But in the exercise that you will go through, you're going to be doing just one load shape for the overall electricity system. And you will attach that exogenously to the module itself. So that would be using that system peak load shape variable at the module level that we were just looking at. Just There's a question about whether you can have one hour time resolution for the whole year. You can, yes, you could set up 8,760 hourly time slices in your model. But if you're doing a long-term projection, if you're projecting for more than a few years, then you'll very quickly find that that slows your model down a lot. So there's a trade-off between the level of temporal resolution in your time slices and the performance of your model. And you can investigate that if you want to and see whether the performance for the type of model that you're creating is, is adequate if you go down to 8,760 hourly time slices. Right now, the finest grained time slices you can have in Leap are hourly. So at most, you can have 8,760 hourly time slices. However, within the next year, we are going to be <laughs> introducing sub-hourly time slices for people who want to model that. And that will probably go down to the level of every minute or maybe every five minutes. So you could even slice up the year into many more time slices, many more than 8,760 once we finish implementing that. I also want to just underscore something that Charlotte said a minute ago about how you put in yearly shapes. So if you load up a yearly shape, and you'll do this in the exercise, if you load up a yearly shape, um, and you, or if you define a yearly shape, you have the option of typing in values, or you can import values from an Excel worksheet. And if you import values, you can import, even if your time slices aren't for 8,760 hours per year, you can import hourly data. And Leap will take those hourly data and aggregate them into your time slices that are in the model. Click on the import button here, Charlotte, and you can show them the 
first option there, import from annual shape, e.g. hourly. That's the option that Leap uses for importing hourly data when you're setting up a yearly shape. And if you define all of your yearly shapes with hourly data, you have to have an Excel workbook open that has hourly data in it. But if you define them with hourly data, then you can easily change your time slice configuration afterwards. And Leap will just rescale those hourly data and re-aggregate them into your new time slice configuration. That's an extremely powerful feature that I don't believe in any other energy system models I've ever come across have. And it would allow you to look at specifically at this trade-off of different time slicing configurations, how those affect your results and the performance of your model. The key thing though, is when you're setting up your yearly shapes in your model, whether it's for load or for the availability of supply resources or other purposes, it's always best to define them with hourly data and then Leap can do that refactoring for you if you change your time slice configuration. Two other questions here, Charlotte. Should historical production and exogenous capacity be the same and how should historical production be utilized in the model? So I'll, I'll answer that one. And then maybe you could take the next one, which is about the optimum projection period. But the, as for this question about historical production and exogenous capacity, they, they are not the same because historical production is an energy quantity and capacity is a power quantity. It represents the amount of power output that you can get from a process. Historical production is used to represent the actual amount of energy that was produced by a process in the historical period. And as Charlotte said, and perhaps you, you could show this again or I could show it, let me, let me quickly share my screen. Here's a Fredonia model. I'm just going to add in some transformation processes by reverting to a different version. Historical production, you can see that it has an energy unit attached to it. It's gigawatt hours in this case. That defines the amount of energy produced by each process before the first, in each year before the first simulation year, which in this case is set to the first scenario year. So it's 2011 in this model. So the historical production covers production of energy by each process in 2010. That's an energy amount. The capacity gets used in the first simulation year and after the first simulation year when you're having leap simulate capacity dispatch. It's also used for determining reliability by comparing to the reserve margin target and using the capacity credit as we've discussed. But the capacity itself is a power unit. It's megawatts here or gigawatts rather than megawatt hours or gigawatt hours. So they are two different things and they're used in two different ways in the model. The key thing to remember about the historical capacities is just a convenience in LEAP for having your model it's a convenient way to re have your model reproduce the production of energy that was observed in the historical period. And then starting at the end of your historical data, you can do a simulation of what the future production will be by having capacity, exogenous and endogenous, having dispatch rules, having a planning reserve margin, and so forth. And Charlotte, I believe the next question was about the optimum projection yeah, was, period. Yeah, and I think the answer to that really lies within, it's a, it's, I mean, the answer is that it's the modeler's choice and it really depends upon the kind of question that you're asking. So there may be, um, if you are thinking about um, modeling your national energy system for um, an NDC submission that where you want to project out to 2050, then you may choose the 35 and model out to 2050. Um, if you are interested in a policy that will be implemented in the next 
five to ten years in your energy system, then you may um, choose to project a shorter time time frame. There isn't really an optimal projection period, but it depends on the type of question that you're asking and also the data that you're using. So you could imagine that you um, that the data that you're using becomes a lot less certain as you project out into the future, and so depending on what type of what um, level of fidelity or accuracy you're trying to achieve in your projection, you may choose to project um, less or more time into the future. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, so I hope that the time slicing has become a lot clearer um, with this illustration. And as Jason emphasized, we really um, suggest that if you do have the data available, that you add your data in an hourly, that you add your data in hourly format and then have Leap do the refactoring according to the time slice for you because it really does provide that additional flexibility of being able to switch between different um, time slices and elaborate or further investigate what the effect of the specific time slice setting that you choose is on your total model. So we've just gone over this. So I'm going to skip through that. Um, here I'm just showing an example of a load shape, how a load shape that you may uh, find in the literature or in um, or elsewhere you may have um, you may have a load trap from your from a specific utility and how you would transfer that into leap so you would essentially represent the load shape shape that you would get and you would add it to leap and you would you see how um, the percent um, load shape here of electricity and generation um, you've added all these different points that are indicated in red here um, to your load shape in LEAP, and so it represents that load shape. So when we think about, sometimes it's easier for people rather than just looking at the interface to go kind of go through a quantitative example, and so we just want to do that as well. Um, so there is, um, you could be setting up, as we just did, um, two time slices instead of a wet and a dry season. Here we've um, would set up a winter and a summer, and the winter would cover 40% of the year, and the summer would cover 60% of the year. And you would also have an annual demand of 100 gigawatt hours. <clears throat> and your load shape would show you that 70% of that demand of the 100 gigawatt hours um, occurs in winter, and 30% occurs in summer. And so when you would calculate your time slice demands, you would multiply that 70% by the annual demand of 100 gigawatts per hour, and you would arrive at 70 gigawatt hours um, of time slice demand during winter and 30 gigawatt hours of demand during summer. But then you also have to um, weigh this demand by the amount of time that is actually um, that is actually part of winter and of summer, and so in this case you would divide your seventy gigawatt hours by the total number of hours in the year and the percent of those hours that occur during winter, which would result in twenty megawatts, and during summer you would divide the thirty gigawatt hours by the total number of hours in the year times the time um, spent during summer. So 60% of the total hours occur during summer, and that would um, result in 5.7 megawatts. And so you see how um, it is both the, the time as well as the load shape that determines what the time slice loads in your respective time periods are. And in this particular example, the peak load would then be occurring during winter, and it would be 20 megawatts. 
and the load during the summer, um, even though because both it um, because the load shape is so much lower in summer um, would only be 5.7 megawatts. And so now you want to put the demand and the supply that you've set up in your model together. And one way to do that is through energy balances. And LEAP provides this very powerful interface that we've hinted at yesterday. I'm just going to show you again where you'd, where you'd find that energy balance. Here, there's this option on the left that you can open. And the energy balances are um, allow you to combine your demand and supply results in LEAP's integrated framework. And you can display the results as standard energy tables, and you can choose which year you would like to look at, which scenarios or regions. So you can display this data at um, different, different resolution. And you can also um, switch the balance columns among fuels, fuel groupings, years, and regions. So your rows on the balance columns here are demand and transformation sectors and modules. And you can optionally show subsectoral results and increase the levels that you are going to display. And you can also view these balances in the form of tables, and then, or not just in the form of tables, but you can also view those results in the form of charts and Sankey diagrams, as you can see here on the right. So this really allows you to visualize in a powerful way um, how your model connects your demand side on the left, uh, your, your supply side on the left, and your demand side on the right. And you can see which of the fuels and processes that you've integrated into your model um, satisfy which of the demands. 